<laughs> anyway, thank you all for showing up. Uh, I'm going to run through the next few field trips here real quick. Uh, there's one Sunday, January 14th at Ankeny. Starts at 9 o'clock. Then somebody by the name of Harry Fuller has one at Sovi Island. I'm meeting people there. We're going to meet at 9 o'clock. Uh, and it's actually, it's in the newsletter. It says it quits at noon, but we'll probably run till about 2.30. Uh, there's lots of miles to cover. And once we've had our fill of cranes, we'll go around and chase geese and swans and, and uh, raptors and such. Uh, there's a trip at Shampooey on the 29th. And then not a field trip, but it's an event I've gotten to attend two or three times, and I'll be there again this year. Uh, the Willamette Valley Bird Symposium, if you're interested in ornithology and science, it's a full dose. It goes all day, uh, and it's at the Oregon State University campus, and researchers come and give quick summaries of their uh, field findings and their research in the last year. Sometimes they go back three or four years, uh, and it's probably the biggest dose of ornithology science available to those of us who aren't on campus all the time. Uh, and it's again, it's on February. Thing just turn off. I don't know. Hello. And now I think Tim has got at least one or two quick announcements before we get into the photo session. So good evening. If uh, if you've been down to Ankeny recently, you've probably noticed that uh, Dave Marshall classroom is well under construction. We expect that it will be done by about three, uh, six weeks and are planning a ribbon cutting kind of a ceremony to both, uh, uh, to both uh, recognize the nature center as a whole. And, the, and, and we never really did a, a celebration of that when we opened Taylor Hall because of COVID conditions and complications. So we're going to do that on March the 16th, put that on your calendar, probably in the, in the afternoon, there'll be something in the Kestrel. Uh, there's some uh, membership forms on the back table and uh, some other things, a new, a new uh, updated bird checklist for Salem on the back table for 2024. I think it's uh, now got all the new updates on the species. So we got a great program tonight. <laughs> Five speakers with uh, photos from all over the world, really. And and to, and to start, um, I've asked uh, uh, Rick Rick Hayfley to to begin to kick us off. He went down to Costa Rica, took some pictures. You may not know Rick Hayfley. He's kind of famous in the fly fishing world. He wrote a classic book in eight, in 1981. I left that book on the back table. But he also, it turns out, is a pretty good photographer, too. So he's going to show us uh, some of his uh, experiences in Costa Rica. Rick? All right. Should I hold this or stick it on my? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I have to do that. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for <laughs> letting me come tonight and show some photos of Costa Rica. I've given talks on insects for decades. This is the first time I've ever talked about birds. So um, uh, if you ask questions about birds, I'll have to ask you, uh, tell you what they eat instead of about the bird. I can tell you what insects they eat. Um, let, what do I push to go forward here? So, wait, it's not, uh, that thing. I should do it. I should do it. Uh, Okay, I get that. Well, that's working. Well, while they're figuring that out, I'll just mention I brought a bird book on Costa Rica. And this is a photo book I just put together after my trip uh, down there. And it has a lot of things besides birds in it, a lot of insects, uh, for one. Um, but uh, monkeys and iguanas and you know just full you know, it's just amazing wildlife in Costa Rica besides the birds but it's a great great birding place of course um, and uh, Carol and I my wife and I were down there the first couple of weeks of November 
in 2019, just before COVID thing came around. Um, and that was a good time to be down there, I think. I don't know a ton about Costa Rica. Uh, that's still considered the wet season. It's kind of the end of the wet season. And December on through the winter into the spring is their dry season. And it gets busier in terms of tourism then. Uh, but really, the weather was fine. It rains kind of every day for a couple hours and uh, dries out. And it's, it's quite comfortable. Uh, so that time of year seemed to work fine. I'm um, going to try to keep this quick because we're going to get through a number of speakers. So down Costa Rica from Portland, fly into San Jose. Uh, and then from San Jose, I spent a week on a photography workshop. And we went down to a resort at Crocodile Bay Resort, which is a great place. This is one of the biggest national parks uh, in Costa Rica down there. A lot of just wild rainforest and uh, great habitat. So that was the first week. And then from there, and that's the photography group there with all of their big lenses shooting all kinds of good stuff. Um, and then uh, what I shot with, the, all the pictures in this were taken for the camera folks out there with a Nikon D500 and a Nikkor 200 to 500 lens. Uh, I've done a lot of cropping on these photos because things were generally a bit of a distance away. Um, so if you have any questions about the photos, you feel free to ask as we go through. And then from there, uh, went up the coast and met Carol, and we went to a little resort, Hacienda Baru, on the coast of the Pacific coast. And then after that, we went into the cloud forest up at Quetzal Valley uh, called uh, Cabins up at 8,000 feet in the cloud forest. So variety of habitats, and it was really a, a nice range of besides wildlife, a lot of different kinds of birds. Each area had its own kind of group of birds you might run into. Um, there's Carol on the beach uh, by Hacienda Baru looking out at some of the rainforest of what's up there. And uh, one thing we found, oh, that's in the cloud forest up at 8,000 feet, kind of what that looked like. Um, and there's uh, a lot of monkeys around and a lot of, yeah, that's a helmeted uh, iguana. Uh, there's a red-eyed frog. So there's just all kinds of fun things to see. So getting into the birds, um, this was the first day when I was at that Crocodile Bay Resort walking around and the scarlet macaws were in the area. This is the only time I had a chance to take pictures of them. The rest of the trip, you'd see them in a distance flying or you'd hear them. And this was the only time, it was like in the first five hours I was there, uh, we had a chance and I got a photo. Uh, but the rest of the trip, you never got close enough to them. So you got to take your chances when you can. You can't ex necessarily expect to run into them. But they're uh, very cool and, and common down there. Um, oop, there we go. So one of the comments is, if you go, it's really helpful to pay for a guide uh, to take you out. Because Carol and I spent a, a full day walking around the trails in the rainforest looking. And we'd hear birds and see something and go, well, what the heck was that? Or can't find them. And the next day, we hired a guide. And it was only like $50 for the day. And he was great. He knew everything about the plants and the birds, and he could find everything. I mean, it was amazing what he was, you know, pointing out that we had no clue. So uh, it just opened up the world tremendously uh, to have the guide with us. And it was our personal guide, just the three of us for the day, and we uh, spent a lot of time hiking around together. And he was just a, a lot of fun to be with, and it was extremely helpful. So I'd highly recommend if you're in a place where you can do that to, to do that. Um, other things, of course, the yellow-throated toucan uh, was something we saw, a very cool bird. Uh, the uh, fire, fiery-billed aracari, aracari uh, was another one that was a little more uncommon. I know the guides were a little more excited when they saw this guy, but uh, uh, we were able to get a picture of it. Uh, it was a neat bird. Uh, emerald toucanet, uh, another one of those. Uh, big build birds down there. And again, uh, if you want to know more about the birds, you're going to have to ask the bird book. Uh, it's uh, not in my uh, range of knowledge too much, just kind of the pictures we got. Um, these guys were cool. This was a pair that had a nest in the tree, uh, the pale billed woodpecker. And if you ever saw a picture of Woody Woodpecker, I mean, to me, it was like, oh, that's where they came up with Woody Woodpecker. But um, they were 
they were pretty entertaining and got pretty close to those guys. Uh, roadside hawks. Uh, these were one of the more common raptors we saw. And that's the common name. I don't know why. I guess because they're common and you see them along roads, I guess. But uh, uh, they, they were the most common raptor we would uh, commonly run into. Uh, Yellow-headed caracara. And there's another caracara down there. I can't remember if it's called the great caracara, but crested, thank you. Um, and we saw both of them, but I never got a good picture of the crested caracara. Now this, the, the bat falcon, this was considered a pretty uh, rare sighting or infrequent sighting. So they were pretty uh, stoked that we got a chance to get some pictures of it. And it's small, it's about the size of a kestrel. Um, and uh, it's pretty kind of neat, neat bird. Owls, the tropical screech owl, uh, ran into those. And, it was amazing. You'd be driving along with the van with a guide, and he'd just stop under this tree and say, there's an owl in that tree. And you go, you're kidding. It would take us 10 minutes to find it after we got out of the van. And, and he says, right there. It's right there. You know, and he saw it while he was driving. The van. He probably drove under that tree a few days before and saw it, too, so he knew maybe to look for it. But it was amazing what they were seeing that I couldn't see. Um, crested owl. Uh, and that's the size of a great horned owl. That was a big owl. Uh, the black vulture, uh, in November, we were seeing the turkey vultures down there too. Uh, but the black vulture was one that was, uh, I think, more resident in that area year round. And we did a, a half day trip down a river uh, along the coast. And that really presented a whole nother group of birds that uh, we saw along the river that were pretty neat. Uh, a variety of kingfishers. Uh, the ringed kingfisher was one of those, uh, but also the uh, Amazon kingfisher uh, and the green kingfisher. And I think this is a female. Uh, but So it saw a variety of kingfishers, which I thought was pretty cool. I, I really liked it. And they're really hard to get pictures of kingfishers around here. Drives me crazy because they uh, don't let you get too close. And you hear them all the time, but you can never get close to get a picture. Um, yellow crowned night herons along the river. So we saw a variety of herons uh, that you don't ever see up here, that's for sure. Uh, the bare throated tiger heron was one of the un really unusual ones. This is a female, and it may be a juvenile as well. The males from the pictures in the book look quite different, um, but it was really a striking bird. And it's the size of a blue heron. And really a beautiful bird. Um, and this was one of the more unusual birds I saw. I really thought it was cool. It's the boat billed heron. And it was on a nest, obviously, with some young. And it's got this big flat <laughs> beak. Uh, that's why it's a boat billed heron, but I thought, wow, that is pretty interesting bird. And then uh, Neotropical Cormorant, this was a completely lucky shot. I was walking along the beach and I had my camera hanging off my neck and with the long lens on it, and I heard some movement out in the water and I saw the cormorant and then I heard a splash and Literally, I just swung around, and I don't even think I looked through the viewfinder. I just started clicking pictures and got this uh, cormorant with the little flounder up in the air. And uh, actually got it within the, trying to swallow it. So that was completely luck, but it was uh, a fun one that turned out. Uh, this was taken uh, while we're basically eating breakfast at this uh, resort on the beach. Um, and they had lots of plants around with different uh, flowering uh, food on them, uh, seeds and berries. And so you'd see birds all the time. You're just sitting there eating. Wow, what's that bird? So this was a blue dancis, uh, dacnus, I guess. Um, and that's the male. And this is the female. The female, that's the male. And they were just flying around eating while you're eating breakfast. Um, and this, the great kiskadee, 
reminded me a lot of uh, the scrub jays around here. They were common, they were loud, they kind of acted like a scrub jay, but they were uh, quite prevalent when you were sitting around in the uh, area where we'd have breakfast. Um, cherries, tanagers, male and female, uh, another interesting uh, bird like that. And then this is up in the cloud forest, um, actually went to a place that had uh, set up for bird photography. You had paid, uh, I don't know what it was like, 30 or 40 bucks for four hours, and you got to be in their uh, area where they had all kinds of plants and habitats set up and uh, covered areas to stand when it's raining where you could get just lots of birds around. So it was all designed just for bird photographers. And this was one of the birds we saw there. This is up in the cloud forest at 8,000 feet, the chestnut cap brush finch. Uh, and these guys, the golden browed chlorophonia was pretty cool. It's the size of a sparrow. Um, and that's the male, and here's the female. Uh, and the silver throated tanager was in this area. And what this is kind of interesting is the clay colored thrush. This is the national bird of Costa Rica, which I thought was a riot given all the dramatic birds they have. And they go, hey, let's make this one the national bird. Uh, <laughs> Okay, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then they have, in the Quetzal Valley area in the rainforest, uh, they have Quetzal stories, resplendent Quetzal. And we paid a guide to go out one morning hunting them. And we missed the male by about a few minutes, but we got a picture of a female, but we never did get a good view of the male. They were in the area, uh, but didn't, uh, weren't in the right place at the right time. Lots of hummingbirds, uh, and I know Joan's going to be showing probably even more pictures of cool hummingbirds uh, from Ecuador. But uh, the green violet ear was uh, common up in the rainforest. It's, they're just gorgeous, and so many other hummingbirds that you would never see uh, up here, of course. Uh, Rufus tailed hummingbird. And these were taken mostly like 15 hundredths of a second to 2 thousandths of a second uh, shutter speeds most part and mostly you're in low light so you know a lot of these are taken at pretty high isos um, and with the new software to do denoise you can get away with some pretty high iso that you still end up with a real sharp picture uh, purple crown fairy was a neat, neat one some of these were around when we we're eating breakfast again but most of these were taken up in the cloud forest Simplet hummingbird. Magnificent hummingbird. White throated hum mountain gem. And uh, this was, I thought, the coolest bird that I saw. It was the great Curacao. And uh, this was down at that Crocodile Bay Resort, first place. And it just kind of popped out of the thick forest. There, they're like wild turkeys. They're big as a wild turkey, and they really like dense cover. And we saw them a couple other times, but they were, you know, just buried in the vegetation and no way could you get a shot. And this just popped out literally again for probably 10 seconds and just had enough time to grab my camera, point it, and shoot. And this is the female. Uh, the male is all black uh, and has kind of a white uh, knob on its, uh, above its beak there. Uh, but this is the female. It's really a cool bird. And that's it. So uh, quick tour of Costa Rica birds. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, if there are any questions, this is a little time. All right. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. No. Uh, Ecuador. So we're going to go further south now. Uh, down to the equator in Ecuador, and uh, why not? Uh, I've, I've heard there's uh, 135 species of hummingbirds in Ecuador, and Joan said in her field guide it shows 126. She saw about half of them, and she's going to show some of them to us tonight. <laughs> oh. 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a wet night. Um, I'm going to show you some photos of the hummingbirds that we saw. I'm echoing. <clears throat> no, I don't know. But this was a, a professionally guided tour that Dave and I took last year to the Northwest Andes area of Ecuador. And the focus of the tour was hummingbirds, Ecuador's spectacular hummingbirds. So it seemed like a good idea. This bird here, the wire-crested thorntail, was one of my target birds. Because you can look ahead of time and see what you might see. And I definitely wanted to see that one. That was it. The tour lasted 10 days. We visited 16 feeder gardens in that time and stayed at four birding lodges. And the feeder gardens and lodges have multiple feeder stations. These are the best places to see hummingbirds because they come, they're used to people, they sit still, they can be 10 feet away from you. You're undercover if it's raining, so you can really just enjoy the birds. And as Tim said, I, we, I personally saw 61 hummingbird species. I missed a few because they're coming thick and fast. If you're looking over here, you'll miss that one over there. Um, so that is roughly half of all the hummingbirds in Ecuador in 10 days. It's just mind blowing. But we did see other birds as well, of course. My total was 339 species in 10 days. The group as a whole had over 400. But I slept in a couple of mornings. Are there many spotted hummingbird I forgot to say? What we see, the many spotted hummingbird are so cute. They're not all flashy and iridescent. I just love the name of this one. It sounds so dramatic. The many spotted hummingbird. And this is one of my favorites, everybody's favorite, the white peaked rapid tail. Has these fluffy boots and then the blue feathered discs on the end of its tail. I tried to photograph females as well when they were pointed out to me. They're much harder to distinguish. Am I still echoing? And this is its cousin. I forgot to say, we were up in the Andes and we traveled down the east slope, the west slope, up to high elevations and down to the lowlands. So m multiple habitats. This Peruvian rapid tail with the orange boots is the east slope cousin of the white boot. It used to be a subspecies, but now it's a species in its own right and well deserved to. Beautiful. Uh, there are some other birds. These puff legs have the feathers on the legs, but not quite as much as the rapid tails. The uh, golden breasted puff leg on the left. I mean, they're all beautiful. I don't know. I've run out of adjectives. But this one on the right, the sapphire vented puff leg, it actually has a bright blue sapphire iridescence on its vent, if I can be so rude, up here, which is amazing to me. Why? Uh. Oh, this is another, everybody's favorite, the violet tail still. It has this beautiful tail, which hops as it flies. Um, we stopped at this restaurant for lunch. It has feeders there on that open side, and it was absolutely pouring with rain. So the uh, bird came into shelter and just posed for us. It was just beautiful. And this is its east slope cousin, the long tail still, which looks it's very similar. They just occupy different areas. And the little female there is cute too. I tried to get a photo of this bird flying because it is spectacular, but I'm afraid that's my best <laughs> attempt. I'm a birder who has a camera, and I upgraded my camera for this trip. 
That's my excuse. Oh, look at this. Look at that, the sword bill coming bird. I looked this up on eBird this afternoon, and it says this ridiculous bird. <laughs> so, its bill is about the same length as its body, about four inches. It has to sit like this with its chin tilted upwards. Otherwise, the weight of its bill will make it topple off the perch. And uh, I just read it has to use its feet to free because that bill is just totally useless. It's the longest bill bird relative to its body size in the world. But it has, oh, that's not right. I didn't get the little things that come in. I had a little picture of it at a feeder port there. Oh, well, never mind. It's very accurate at the feeder port. And I also had a picture of the uh, tiger blossom that it usually feeds from. It's a really long trumpet flower. Uh, we, as I, I keep mentioning feeder gardens. This is an example of one of the favorite ones that we went to. We saw 15 species of hummingbird at this feeder garden. Plus, a ton of other birds. Which I don't know if you can quite see it, but oh, the, uh, the feeders are numbered one through maybe 10 or 12. There's a number five there. So if you're looking for something particular, you can ask the guide, let me know if you see whatever. Uh, no, it doesn't come up. A uh, crowned wood nymph, and they can say, crowned wood nymph but number four, so that you have a better chance of seeing it. These birds were photographed there. Um, oh no. Hmm. Anyway, uh, this is unusual because the female has a little bit of iridescence. Not many female hummingbirds have iridescence. You can just see a little bit up on the shoulder. It's very heavily cropped, photo. But it's, I mean, he has enough to spare, doesn't he? Hmm, I'm going to have a problem in a minute when my second photo disappears. But okay, the uh, rufous tail hummingbird is very common bird and widespread. But that doesn't mean it's not beautiful. And I like it because it's recognizable fairly easily. So if you've got 10 hummingbirds around the feeder, you can eliminate this one pretty quickly. Or not like that. Identify. Uh, this one, the velvet purple coronet, has so much iridescence, but in some light, it looks almost completely black. If you don't have that shining at you, it looks completely different. That's one of my favorites. Oh, now, this uh, purple throated wood star on the left and the brown violet here, here on the right, this is a, another feeder garden that we went to where the owner had this trick of dipping these blossoms in sugar water and hanging them up. So it looks like, on your photo, it looks like they're just feeding from a flower. Nah. Really nice. We were there for about four and a half hours. <laughs> just gone. Really pretty. Or you can hold the blossoms in your hand and they'll come onto your hand. The, uh, just to feel their little feet gripping your fingers, it's amazing. And excuse me. So you can see on the left there, that velvet purple coronet does have some purple on its head now and that. But this one is almost all dark. Our guy put the blossom on his head and took a selfie of him with it. This is the largest hummingbird in the world. It's hard to tell from one photo, and I do have some figures, but I'm not sure which is what. Okay. Um, he's about eight inches long, maybe more than eight. And for uh, comparison, the Anna's hummingbird is under four inches. So if this guy showed up next to your Anna's, Hummingbird at your feeder, <laughs> everybody would be surprised, including the Annas. <laughs> I have two, I have two texts. 
I know what it says, but, but there's one photo I particularly want that I've got coming in second. I've got to have it. Ah. Anyway, yeah. Hmm. This is uh, this. So that was that was the largest bird. That is the largest hummingbird. So obviously it was the largest hummingbird we saw. And this is the smallest hummingbird we saw. It's not far off being the smallest hummingbird at all. It's about two and a half inches. The gorgeous of wood star. And uh, it likes these verbena flowers. I have a photo of it zooming around in the verbenas, and it's tiny like a little insect. That photo should come in right there. Shoo. Yeah? Uh, this is another bird that likes these verbena flowers, the golden tailed sapphire. It loves to just rest there and perch there, showing off its golden tail and all its beautiful feathers. <laughs> oh no, this is the uh, the wild Sumatra Lodge, one of the lodges we stayed at. They had planted this big bed of verbenas and other flowers for the hummingbirds. I have a beautiful photo of the golden tailed sapphire right there. No, no. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Ah, uh, the, the, um, one of my favorites, the wire crested thorntail, also like that verbena bed. Um, I like the female, she's so perky. I like the females. They're not so flashy. Yeah. And these are some other birds from that lodge there. They had feeders all along the deck and at the end. Let's see the birds that just come in. This is the good thing about the feeder gardens. The birds will perch on these strategically placed natural looking perches looks like you just happened across them somewhere. I like that one with his tongue out. I think it was licking its lips that it just finished feeding. <laughs> and this is some other beautiful birds. I have cropped the feeder out on a lot of these photos, so this, I left this bit in, so you can see it's sitting next to a feeder, but you wouldn't know that. Check that out. And some of them, like this greenback hill star, we only saw it at one feeder garden. So often they were specialized in one particular hummingbird. Oh, we, we did see some birds not at feeders, but you can see how the uh, photos are not to the same standard or detail. The black hole crane bearer, someone spotted it as we were driving along, so we all piled out of the van to try and get a photo. And uh, the, uh, the Ecuadorian hill star, it feeds almost exclusively on these plants up on the slope, the high slopes. We were at about 12,000 feet up in the Andes here, cold. And we managed to find this little female feeding. You can see she's just got stain in her face because that is all she feeds on. And I found out that is the national flower of Ecuador. The Chupiraga, I think. Don't quote me on that one. And now back to R, oh, the feeder, the spangle hooker. One of my top 10 favorites. <laughs> I have a lot of favorites. Um, this was a brand new feeder garden that had just opened. It was really only just getting going, but they had planted at least a hundred yards, at least a football field length of these verbena plants. This spangled coquette was the star of the show. When we got there, the lady said, oh, you just missed it. Well, you know what that was like. But she said, don't worry, he'll be back in 15 minutes. And you could more or less set your watch by this bird coming down to the verbenas to feed the 15 minutes for about maybe half a minute, and then he would just flip back up 
into the sort of slope of the back screen. You would never, you couldn't see it up there. You would never see this. I mean, you would have a hard time seeing this out in the wild. It's so tiny. And I'm afraid I've, now my shining sunbeams is my favorite, favorite top one ever bird. The photo is missing. Tim, can we? Wait, maybe we can go off of, uh, can we go off the screen slideshow? This is the photo I want. Yeah, look at that. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's here. I'm sorry, but this is my absolute favorite hummingbird <laughs> in the whole world. And one of my favorite photos, too. I'll just tell you while we're uh, trying to get that up that I have the Canon EOS R7 camera, which I bought specifically for this trip. Up until then, I had been using the Canon PowerShot SX70, but I wanted more definition on my coming years on this trip, and I think I got it. And the lens was the, uh, I think it's in the RF100-400. The whole rig only weighs three pounds. I can't carry heavy, heavy, big, heavy lenses. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, you'll have to take my word for it that this shining sunbeam is the most amazing hummingbird in the world. <laughs> Even though I had looked at the birds before we went, I had no idea that this was going to be so amazing. It just blew me away. <laughs> and every time I look at this photo, it blows me away again. Let's see. I forgot to mention that the tour was organized by a company called Ventures Birding, which is a very small company out of uh, North Carolina. We knew them from previous trips when we lived in South Carolina. And it was, it was very well organized, nice people, good lodges, apart from that one that was below freezing. Uh, <laughs> There were four of us in the group. We had two guys and a driver. And sometimes we had another guy who was, came with the lodge. But sometimes we almost, the guys almost outnumbered us. <laughs> but that was just a fluke because somebody had to cancel at the last minute. Three people, I think, had to cancel. Well, now, you will have to go, your homework is to go home and look up the shine and sunbeam because this, uh, this is the uh, Living Bird magazine that came out just after we got back from this trip. If any of you get that, it's from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And on the back is the back of the shining sunbeam. This is on the back of that bird. It's just amazing. Pastel rainbow. It's just beautiful, and I'm so sorry I can't show you it. Maybe we will. Oh, yeah, I was, there's a couple of books here you might want to look at. Um, this one is a life-size guide to every species, it's called. But it doesn't show photos of every species. There are 60 or more that don't have a photo. But the ones that do have are really nicely done. And with my shining sunbeam, it only shows the front. And I look at this book before I go away to see what I might see. I had only seen the front of that bird, and that's why I was just never worry about it. But it, you know, it has, this is the, the sword billed hummingbird. It shows really nice natural looking photos. It's a nice sort of coffee table book with a little bit more than that. If 
fruit. Mm-hmm. The fruit. Oh. The role of it is to No. The question is, why do the boots, the booted racket tails, have those feathery boots? And I do not know for sure, but I'm thinking it has something to do with keeping the legs warm. They were all, they, uh, the puff legs especially, they were up on the edges of like a cloud forest. But, yeah. Uh, they are lower, but if you in a, the racket tails are a bit of a lower elevation species, so I'm not sure. Sorry. <laughs> I think the, I think the, the ladies, the females choose the ones with the best boots. And so that that gene keeps repeating. <laughs> That's okay, don't worry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, if anybody wants to see my photo of the shining sunbeam, I mean, I love the name of it too, shining sunbeam. But when I saw that iridescence on its back, I was just blown away. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna uh, we're gonna go north, way north, north of Alaska, uh, to what's called Park, and Crossing our fingers on this one. I've got a lot of overlapping slides. So many of you folks know Jeff Hardy. Um, he's presented here before. He's down in Lebanon. And he and I and his brother Lee met up with their cousin Barbie in Wasilla, just outside of Anchorage. A little bit closer. <laughs> I'll hold it. Down here. You get the echo still. So this was in July of 2023. Um, Jeff and his brother Lee were up there about 10 days before me, and I met them up there on July 21st. So this is an ether map showing you where we went. And originally, our goal was to go from Fairbanks all the way up to the North Slope across the Brooks Range, but the vehicle was not up to the task. It was Barbie's and we did not want to destroy it. So we wisely turned around and just explored, which was incredible. So um, this is the Denali Highway. We spent three days here. Jeff and his brother went up to Chicken before I got there. Um, it was a great name for a city, town. We went down to the Seward Peninsula and took separate trips out of the Kenai Fjords. We also went down to Homer and explored around Anchorage as well. First stop when I got there was Denali State Park. And the habitat here reminded me a lot of the North Woods in the Eastern United States. It was kind of interesting to see some of the species there that you would not expect for the West. Good, okay. Northern water thrushes were everywhere there. Think of those as an Eastern bird. They have them in Oregon, but not nearly as common. And alder flycatchers, definitely an Eastern bird. Is this coming through all right? Okay, this is a number, of, I grew up in Wisconsin and there was quite a few birds that I saw that I hadn't seen in 30 years. So that was a great thrill of the trip as well. And this place was also full of common red poles, which we're used to seeing maybe once in a while in Eastern Oregon. So it was actually a very common bird there. We spent three days on the Denali Highway um, having the luxury of a camper so we could stop wherever we wanted to. And this was a mix of taiga and tundra habitat. We saw just tons of birds. I uh, don't have photos of all of them, but yodeling red-throated loons, uh, white-winged scoters with young, long-tailed ducks with young. It's just incredible the stuff we saw. Full of gray-cheeked thrushes, another bird I think of as an eastern bird. 
And when you see a waxwing, it's a bohemian waxwing up there. It's not a cedar waxwing. Great cheek thrush. And that was one of our hunted birds. That's an Arctic warbler. It's the only member of its genus and family that actually breeds in the United States. That was one of the goals. And they breed in these wet willow situations. Once we figured out the song and the habitat, we saw quite a few of them very well. This is this first night we spent on the Denali Highway where we had yodeling, red-throated loons, among other things. Long-tailed duck with its young. That was a juvenile American tree sparrow. Another bird that we don't see all, yeah. Another bird we don't see down here all that often. And that was a boreal chickadee. Uh, we found boreal chickadees in quite a few places and had really fantastic looks at them. They kind of sound like chestnut, chestnut back chickadee a little bit in their call. That's how we were able to pin them down. But that was, that was the common chickadee that we saw was boreal chickadee. Uh, Jeff and his brother Lee and Barbie took one trip on the Kenai Fjords out of Seward and I took a separate trip, but we ended up having similar experiences. Lots of alcids. Alcids are the birds in the family, like puffins and murres. Um, on my trip, we saw 12 different species of alcids. Uh, it was also a fantastic whale trip. Uh, Red-faced cormorants, a bird that we don't ever see down here. They're more common in the Aleutians in Western Alaska. And obviously puffins, horned puffins, as well as tufted puffins. One really special alcid breeds only in the scree slopes at the edge of glaciers. And that's this bird, the Kitslet Murlet. You want to see one, you have to be either way out in the Aleutians or get lucky in one of these boat trips. But that was a huge, huge find for us. Kind of like a marble roulette, but a little bit paler, a little bit browner. And the whales. Um, we saw 40 to 50 humpback whales, and they were bubble net feeding. So they come up in these big circles, little bubbles, and they catch all the fish inside of them. And you knew it was going to happen because all the birds converged in that spot just before it happened. Lots of black lake kitty wakes in that area as well. Another one of the whale shots I get that most of these shots were Lee's and Jeff's. They had better camera equipment. This was one of my lucky shots. That guy flipping his tail. And these are the best shots we had of parakeet offlets, which are much more common as you go into Western Alaska as well. So they do occur occasionally occur on pelagic trips in February in Oregon. A little bit cold for that. Anchor Point is near Homer. We went searching for Arctic terns and Aleutian terns there. We got skunked on the Aleutian terns, but there's plenty of other good birds here. Those are Arctic terns, uh, an adult and a juvenile, and there were just tons of them. There's a huge colony there, but we had fantastic looks. Anybody recognize that species? Surf bird. This was not the best breeding plumage one we had, but that's a bird that we see down here on our coast as well. And Wimbrel as well, as well as other shorebirds that were there. Uh, big open expanses, Anchorage area. This was a great find, a nice breeding plumage, Pacific loon. A nice small calm lake instead of watching them fly by in the ocean. Much better look. Plenty of moose to see as well. And I don't know how many people are gull people, but we have what we call the Olympic gull here, which is a hybrid. 
So they have what is called the Cook's Inlet gall, and that is also a hybrid. This is a hybrid between herring gulls and glaucous winged gulls. So we're not the only ones that have that problem sorting out gulls. I think we set those into the eBird as, as herring gulls, and the, the local reviewer corrected us on it. So this was the camper, and when we turned around from the Dalton Highway, we ended up in Fairbanks. So where did we park? In the Walmart parking lot. And there's a place called the Creamery National Wildlife Refuge, and this cute little short-tailed weasel gave me quite a show. I have a video on my phone I was not able to download. He, he was just as curious about me as I was of him. And Canada Jays were very common. This specific one was our dog's tormentor. Um, this is Oliver. And we were throwing food to that Canada Jay, and Oliver wanted to chase that Jay. So the Jay would lead him into the forest as far as he could go and then fly back in time for some food. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, correct. Um, the gentleman's asking about Anchor Point. He saw the boats in the water. They would actually have to drag those boats out, but I don't know what they were fishing for, but coho would be a good guess. That was the end of July, correct? I don't think they, they were not halibut fishing, so it probably had to be some sort of salmon. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much. And next, we have some, a bonus uh, presentation. It wasn't in your guest role. Uh, Albert Reitman, who many of you are familiar with, uh, leads work, uh, photography workshops over to Malier, and he's going to show some photos from Malier now. This is a tandem presentation with uh, the uh, Harney County uh, bird expert uh, standing the wings to correct any uh, mistakes I make. I, I have a, I do have a uh, disclosure to make. You know, I spent my career in medicine, and anytime you get up and talk, you have to disclose. You know, if you get paid off by some pharmacy or you know some you know uh, equipment rep. Well, my disclosure is that I'm hired by the Harney County. Um, uh, board of uh, Commissioners to come and advertise Harney County as a destination. So the Chamber of Commerce wanted me to come here and tell you what a great place it is. And you got just joking. But um, uh, I've been there many times and it is a destination that you can get to in a few hours. And depending on when you're there and at different times of the year, there are spectacular opportunities to see a whole range of, you know, wonderful uh, birds. And if you haven't been there, uh, I'm going to encourage you to buy Harry's book and you know when to go and where to go because he's written a book on the subject and um, we're proud to have him have done that. So we're going to talk just briefly about a tiny number of the species there. Uh, and uh, one of the important things is you have to know depending on what you want to see, when to go and where to go. Got a button there to push. So this was one of our favorite uh, targets, uh, Ferruginous owls. And I don't know if it's going to be there this year, but um, on some years, they have a nest. In this case, you can see they had this, uh, three, uh, three uh, uh, nestlings. And um, you, know, you just knew you show up there. If you wait long enough, mom or dad is going to come back. Uh, and um, it was great fun this time because there was a kingbird that nested in the tree and uh, harassed, mobbed the poor. I mean, you think of be, you know, talk about fighting the hand that feeds you. And here they are being protected in this wonderful tree. Uh, and yet <laughs> the poor birds, you know, they would attack the hawk 
parent when I came back, you know, uh, bring food for the for the chick. So, but these fruits and his hawks were kind of the star of the show for the last trip. Got some something to say? Yeah, just one of the ways you know this is for Richard. Look at that gate comes back behind the eye. They swallow this prey whole. Huge mouth, about twice the size of me. So, um, depending on when you go, uh, you'll have an opportunity to see birds that you wouldn't see otherwise, uh, particularly if you buy Harry's book and you know where to go. So, uh, off of uh, what is it, Sod House uh, Lane uh, or Greenhouse Lane, um, you can see these uh, Wilson snipes sitting on uh, uh, poles advertising their presence, on, on posts advertising their presence. You're, you know, just guaranteed to see them. The rest of the time, God help you, you know, looking for a snipe is a real snipe hunt. But they're just out there, you know, uh, uh, chirping away and they're annoyed to have you get close enough to take a, a picture. So it's always good fun to, to, to visit them. And these American apps, it all depends on the year. If it's a wet year, you know, they'll be nesting and you'll find, you know, they're just a dime a dozen. On a dry year, God help you, you're just not going to see them. Um, now, if you want to see horned larks, you got to go to Chicken Chickahominy, Chicken Hominy Re Re uh, Reservoir. Otherwise, you're not going to see them. So, if you don't read Harry's book and you don't know that there's a place called Chicken Hominy, and you just drive by it on on Highway 20, so Highway 20 is the longest road in the U.S. Uh, you know, it goes all the way from here to Maine, I think. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're driving to Maine, and how would you know that if you you know, just off the road, you can, you know, bring out your um, bird song, you know, your Sipley's bird noisemaker, and darn it, these things won't just come flying into your, you know, to the, um, uh, a uh, sagebrush near you. Uh, and another just absolutely classic uh, bird to see uh, is the western meadowlark, and it's, you know, it's just such a joy to be able to photograph these things, singing their little hearts out. And you're pretty much guaranteed to be able to do that. If it's a wet year, and this was a wet year, you get these white-fronted ibises by the, literally the thousands. Um, and they'll be flying over and, you know, you just say, well, gee, there's just no end of these things. Boy, I can just come any year. And, and then the next year, you know, you have to um, uh, work very hard to find a single one. So it all depends, you know, on on water, how much it's rain. Um, one of the great advantages of rain is that you see these, you know, wonderful collection of birds that like water. But that same year, there are these insects called mosquitoes that love eating you. <laughs> and, um, you know, some of us, you know, don't mind it. But uh, the rest of us, you know, when you step out of your car, and there's 10,000 mosquitoes who, you know, want to, um, you know, suck you, uh, suck you dry. Uh, it gets to be a bit, an, uh, bit unnerving. It might be the right word. We typically stay at uh, Mount Here Field Station, and uh, you know, we stay in these, you know, these um, kind of um, 1960s era uh, uh, barracks that were built for the Job Corps, and. You know, when you walk out the door and you're assaulted by these, you know, thousands of mosquitoes, it, you know, it's, it's like you're running the gauntlet, you know, you're like the Iroquois Indians who, you know, we're going to attack the, you know, the poor hostages when they're trying to get from point A to point B. You just feel like that with these uh, mosquitoes. It doesn't matter how much you put on. These night houses are nice. Where do they migrate from? Central America, one of the longest migrating uh, birds in the area, and uh, they are real stuff. And they eat a lot of mosquitoes. Not enough. <laughs> not enough. Not nearly enough. And they'll be perched on, you know, um, on poles or bird or, or power lines, and it, they're just so much, uh, so much fun to see in photographs. We talk about it a little bit. One of the reasons we do the photo trip in June is that's the time of year when certain bird behaviors can be seen, and it's the only time. The bobolink get there in late May, and by 
the second week of June, they're on nests. You can't find them, they're hiding in the willows. But when the males first get back, it's all about fighting and territory. At one point last June, we drove for an hour in the diamond. We couldn't find them anywhere. We stopped at lunch at the hotel, headed out, it had warmed up, and all of a sudden we had three male bobolinks fighting, knocking each other out of the tree, singing in the air, chasing each other around. I think they sat there for an hour and a half taking pictures. They were just insane with testosterone. And it only happens for a short bit of time. Once they've made it and they've got a nest, they're hard to find. They stop singing. They hide in the willows. Nighthawks are one of my absolute favorite birds out there. And what's really cool about them are the last ones back that nest because they cannot survive if there's not a lot of insects in the air. So if they get back in mid-May and it gets cold and it's 35 degrees at night and 48 in the daytime, they're starving to death. So they're the last birds back. They get back right at the end of May, early June. They haven't made it yet. They don't have a nest. They're starving. They've just flown 2,000 miles. They feed all day. You can get flocks of 150 to 200 at noon overhead, like purple martins, except it's common nighthawks. Three weeks later, you're lucky if you see more than two or three in the evening, and they're feeding, and it's already dark, and you'll never get this picture. Once they've nested and made it, they don't sit on the fence post right next to your car in the daytime. So that's why we do the photo trip in June. Best photos you're ever going to get of bird behavior for that week or week and a half. Great horned owls. <clears throat> I think this was at Benson Pond, as I recall. Um, and, um, you know, this is, I, my, my experience was I had never seen a great horned owl. And somebody said there was one, and we got out of the car, and we could see this, this big owl, you know, 100 yards away. And I took a picture, and then I snuck a little closer and snuck a little closer, you know. And I finally got under the tree, and there he was looking back at me like, you know, what, you know, what are you doing? Uh, so they, they are. Uh, it's always uh, always fun to always fun to find them, um, and you know people know where birders know where they are, and you can go go find them. Uh, this was uh, uh, a series of pictures that uh, Harry got put in the uh, uh, Oregon Birding Journal. Why don't you tell them about the our adventure? Yeah, this is a series of pictures that Albert took. Uh, a couple of years ago, and the uh, prairie falcons had nested on uh, Lake Harney Road. Uh, and there's a series of blushes go west from Highway 205 on that road. And they had nested on the face of the third one, which is vertical. And they had raised three or four young, three young. And we were there, and the young had started to uh, leave the nest, and they were fledglings and they were flying around and they were basically 14 year olds on dirt bikes. They were just crazy. They were doing everything. They were diving on dad, hitting him in the back of the head, chasing their mom, going after each other in the air, causing all kinds of chaos. This was three 14 year olds that had never been told you can't do that. Uh, and they were doing it at Falcon speed. So they were chasing each other. They were flying, zooming around uh, in the front of the, the, the cliff face. And the high point of the whole thing, I think, was two of them flew out over the, the flats, over a lake bed that had been dry for several years, Harney Lake. Uh, and then we heard screaming. And they're coming back. And we see them coming. And there's somebody chasing. They had flown over a curlew nest. And Mr. Curlew said, I'm going to stab you little MFs. He was chasing me, screaming. He was never going to catch them. They're about twice as fast as he was. But the two terrified baby prairie falcons go flying by, and the curlew was screaming at them. And they were gone for, what, 20, 25 minutes before the curlew finally came back and went back to his nest. We didn't see the babies again that evening. I think they were probably hiding out in the sagebrush somewhere. God, that guy with a stiletto is still after us. But anyway, this is what they were doing. This great picture that Albert got. This is two youngsters attacking each other in the air. Nobody got hurt. They never knocked any feathers off, but they were just, you know, think about 14 year olds on skateboards with no adult supervision. It's amazing, here you are out in the middle of the high desert and there are these darn water birds, I mean, shorebirds, you know, what the heck are curlews and 
Well, it's, you know, doing just in the middle of middle of the end. Um, again, it depends on what kind of year you've got, you know, what you're going to get. So um, one of the uh, uh, favorite birding spots um, for anybody who's uh, in the Harney County, Malheur area is the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge headquarters. And it's a migrant trap. You know, it has lots of nice big green trees and it's got, that are watered and there are uh, a lot of foliage. And, um, you know, if you want to see something like a Western tanager, you know, that's the kind of place to go. It's just amazing what will kind of drop in out of the sky and everybody shows up there at least once a day <clears throat> to see who's come to stay for a couple of days. And then they're, then they're gone. They have a uh, signboard there where everybody puts interesting sightings. So it's the first place you want to go every morning. Who saw what? Where? Where do I go to find that burrowing owl nest that the guy mentioned last night? That didn't. Nobody, Nobody will tell you where to find the burrowing owl nest. It's all secret. But they'll tell you they're out there someplace. And you go there. And uh, Anyway, so uh, again, it depends on the year. You know, if it's wet, sandhill cranes, you know, the nesting. But um, if it's dry, you know, you know, they just ain't going to be there. So a couple more stars are here's the bobolink that he was uh, talking about in the uh, in the wild rose bushes, and then the, you know, they're on the uh, greenhouse lane. You know, if it's wet, you know, you just you know, just beautiful opportunity to photograph. Uh, you're just not going to get a better opportunity to photograph. Yellowhead uh, blackbirds strutting their stuff. Boy, they just these old males just want to make sure that you know who the king of the king of the uh, fence post is. Mm -hmm. They sure are. And there's you know continuing with the theme of yellow, these chats are yellow-breasted chats are always at Cane Spring. So you know you you just you just don't you say well. Yeah, where am I going to see a yellow-breasted chat? And this is the only place I've ever seen them. I guess maybe there's some at French Glen too. But you know, they like water, and they like and well, I mean over there. So um, I, every time I've seen them, they've been near that Payne Springs, Page Springs campground. And if you don't buy Harry's book, you don't know where you're going to find it. But that's where they are. Um, and then this. Um, Yellow, common yellow throat um, was at Benson Pond off of the patrol road. Uh, and they, you know, there's the, in that, uh, in the, uh, with the, with the wetland, with the cattails, with the, you know, the wet, wetland area there along the central patrol road, um, you know, the, it's infested with these kinds of, you know, birds that you're just not going to see anywhere else um, in uh, Eastern Oregon. So this illustrates something that um, uh, I'm sure all birders encounters, and, it, and these are trumpeter swans. And this is not taken a year or two ago. This was taken like five years ago, five, six years ago, and they haven't been seen since. So for Yeah, the last time we know they nested there was 2017. Uh, they were probably an introduced species. I've talked to the swan expert in Oregon. He's not sure that historically they ever nested there. Uh, and with the continuing drought and climate change, they may never nest there again. Uh, they have nested also at Summer Lake, but last year they did not succeed. So it's not at all clear that trumpeter swans will remain in Malheur uh, or Harney County. But this was, I think, at Crumpo Reservoir, and we saw them once, and you know, never, never again. Again, continuing with the yellow theme, yellow warbler, no, just. No, you know, just knock your eyes out. You know, you just, you know, just, just, it's just amazing how yellow, yellow can be. And the same with our yellow finch there. The, this, they were, this was, they were both not far from French Glen on that Central Patrol Road or near it. Uh, this is our, you know, the, our, our same Perugian's hawk. You know, the, you know, we started with the Perugian's hawk and, you know, and this is a blackbird you know, mobbing this poor dad who, you know, wants to, does, doesn't want anything more than to feed his, you know, babies. And he's not feeding them on blackbirds, but 
they uh, make life miserable for these guys. And this is the last photo. One of the things about the photo trip, and there's information about it back there, you can talk to Alpha about it afterwards, is this, is this is not a typical bird trip. It's not about the checklist. It's about we're going to take the patience and the time to get the photos that are interesting. We spent hours at that Ferruginous hawk nest and finally got pictures of the kingbird on the Ferruginous hawk's back, pecking the back of its head. I talked to the guy who wrote the, the bird uh, uh, summary of Western kingbird or birds of the world online. He had heard about that, never had seen a picture of it happening before. But cameras now, and you people with good cameras know this, can see things that our eyes miss. We watched that whole thing. We had no idea what was going on. But one guy was shooting 200 frames a second. He's got a whole sequence of the kingbird attacking the Ferruginous hawk. We could only guess what was happening. He got proof. And this is classic. We all know that nighthawks swallow bugs in the air. This is a nanosecond before that bug is dead. You can only do that with modern digital cameras. If that had been shot with film, there'd be a, just a blur. This guy's going 45 to 50 miles an hour. The bug's going five miles an hour. And this is perfectly in focus. And this is one of the kinds of pictures that we work at from the June trip. Any questions? Thank you very much. And now to bring us home, in more ways than one, Stephanie, who many of you know, also has done many programs for us, is going to talk about her backyard birds and ways that she supports them. I think you got the long version. I, I don't think this is the short version the, that I gave you. But um, it'll have all the pictures and more. It's a good thing I'm last. <laughs> yeah, but uh, OK. It'll work out. It'll all be good. Uh, that's very odd. What I uploaded uh, was a brief version. This is a version that I made for um, Mary County Master Gardeners called Gardening for Birds. And so you're getting the long version, even though I thought I so spent with the short version. Oh, it's a good thing I'm less. All right, that's OK, no. So um, Ray and I moved out in the country about 12 years ago, and we looked really hard for a piece of land that uh, wasn't developed, plowed, trampled, you know, whatever. And we found a wild place covered with blackberries. So that all we've done is remove blackberries and then add native plants. And so um, I brought you some seeds so that you can start growing native plants to keep your birds at home. So birds are like us. They need food, shelter, safety, ability to reproduce. And um, so that's what we're getting. And so we have 800 species in the United States, and uh, some live Year, year round, some of them migrate seasonally, some just stop by. And so we've had at least 500 species of birds recorded in Oregon. And you can read that. And in our yard, we have a bird count, and I'm sure we're up in the 90s but when we made this list, we were four birds. So some birds eat seeds, but most and most and berries, but most of the birds are going to eat some kind of caterpillar or insect when they're feeding their babies at least um, our songbirds. And so it's really important not to use pesticides, not to worry about caterpillars, you know, enjoy your trees being chewed because it's all part of the life cycle. Uh, I think Doug Tellamy said that uh, it takes about 10,000 caterpillars to grow up and nest from chickadees to fledgling and the phoenix bats. So you need to have 10,000 caterpillars in your neighborhood for one little nest of birds. So um, behold and rejoice when you have bugs on your plant. Um, okay. 
So this is what we have in our place. Big leaf maples uh, will support uh, swallowtail caterpillars and the Lomatium species will, is a, another plant. It will support and swallowtails and you can read down the list. At our house, we have different kinds of asters, alder trees, and so you'll even need native grasses to grow stippers. Stippers uh, eat grass as caterpillars and they behave in the ground. So I'm not really prepared for this slide, so I'm prepared for a door one, that's okay. Um, we also have a mountain ash tree, so we have lots of uh, berry brush and we have electric. So I make this one into a Christmas card, so you may have gotten this one for some time. <laughs> Okay, and so you can plant a lot of things that make berries, the berry eating birds. So one time Ray and I took a trip over to the John Day and we saw all these cedar waxwings in this tree and we didn't know why. We stopped and they were eating petals. I had no idea until I looked it up that cedar waxwings eat fruit tree petals and they're not damaging the fruit. Uh, You'd like to avoid non-native species because the robins are going to poop out the seeds all over. So you really don't want heavenly bamboo or nandina in your yard. Or if you like it, cut off the berries. Not only that, they're poisonous. So if you like to use a ton of them, they will die. And then um, holly gets pooped out. We live near a holly and they cut the holly and spread it around at Christmas time. Well, those birds are going to poop holly seeds all over the place. And once you get holly, if you just cut it off, the runners go out and you've got holly all over the place. So red eyes or dogwood would be a nice substitution. Uh, so would the uh, mahonia. And uh, what we like in our backyard is sunberry, honeysuckle. So it, it's a bush that grows this big and it likes watery areas. You could grow it in a swampy area, but if you grow it in your backyard, you will need water in the summer. I like it because on, at the same time, You'll have a mature berry that's feeding your early arriving cedar waxwing, and you'll have flowers on the same branch that are feeding bees and hummingbirds. And you can go up by just coming over to our house, slacking off the branch, stick it in the ground, and in a few years, you'll have a bee. Um, Ray Temple is my husband. He likes to make bird boxes, and we've discovered you can't have too many bird boxes. Um, but it'll all work itself out. If you saw a dead snag, it would have dozens of holes in it and dozens of different birds choosing their place. So you don't really have to be like six and a half feet apart and, uh, you know, whatever. You can just put them in there. And this was taken over at the lake in Chickahominy Reservoir. So I thought that was pretty cool that they were having a fight over who gets to have that. And if there were enough boxes, there wouldn't be that fight. So we have white-throated sparrows, and the um, talk I was going to give you showed seeds spread out on the ground. We don't use feeders uh, because I'm a retired veterinarian. I would tell you to keep your feeders as clean as dishes that you would serve on your own table. I don't have the discipline to do that. So we spread very far apart in different areas on the ground only enough for them to eat in a half a day. So you can reduce rats and pooping and all in the same place. So I have a nice picture of a white-throated sparrow face to face because I put my camera on a tiny tripod, walked inside the house and used my phone to take a picture of it. So I use this baiting to take pictures too. And we have a tree in the backyard it's me and my kitten remember right now. The locust tree. And it's just it's it's filled with birds and it's filled with bees. So, so this is how we spread the food out. There's a little paving stone area. Pops up with dirty feeders. And also Ray has put out boards so that we can have snakes. So if I do trap a mouse in the garage, I'll go put it under that board. And in short order, the snakes are eating the mouse or whatever it happens to be. 
Okay, so we have a lot of garters here. And this is supposed to run. Ah, yes, it's there. Um, when we moved in, we had a lot of gophers. And not wanting to kill gophers, for obvious reasons, you know, they feed birds, um, they came up with these um, raised beds. And then we put them up on blocks so that you don't have to bend over. And the gophers can't get up there. But our dog got up there and was eating all of his sprinkler heads. So I think raising them up helps that. But the gophers are going to feed all your owls. So you don't want to kill your gophers. You want to live with them. And you could line, you could make a screen. And they have screens that don't rot, that, you know, don't rust. And you could make that shape, and then you could put it in the ground. You know, it helps make your plants you know, go for a while. Um, this we got out of the Hill Golf Course. Has some roots. Let us uh, walk. She was really good at finding some bell pals. And that bell was on a hill beach. So, so this is red elderberry. This is on our house. This is another good plant for feeding birds and pollinators in the springtime. We have a lot of um, milkweed because we've had really good luck attracting monarchs to our place. You know, we've raised 50 monarchs. We've had them just around in California. They're all inspired about monarchs. So we have lots and lots of milkweed. Well, I counted like 14 different species of animals that use milkweed, including lots of hummingbirds. Uh, last summer, we saw a baby hummingbird not know how to eat. And he was actually standing on the plants and falling off because he couldn't perch on the big plants. And he had to learn how to hover. So that was kind of fun. Uh, we get these flat hummingbird feeders so that you wash them. Uh, um, we wash, we have six or eight hummingbird feeders to two locations. So we're always, one's in the dishwasher, one's home, one's home, one's in the cupboard. And we just make new food every other day. We don't store it in the fridge, so it gets moldy. Or it's a cup of sugar, a cup of water, warm it up, put it your fix your coffee. By the time you're done, it's solved and put it out. New, new food every day or every other day. Also, uh, rejoice when you have spiders, because that's what hummingbirds use to make their little nests together. So don't kill your spiders. And as you can tell, I like them. Um, if you do use a feeder, do something that you will wash every day. So this is just a plant stand with a dresser. And then go ahead and plant uh, things and let them go to seed. So these are honey or these are sunflowers, yeah. And then the finches too for sunflowers. We go we do a raptor run for Jeff Fleischer, and this is an oak tree out on the Armand Road. Just love that oak tree. Um, the mistletoe is this winter food for uh, bluebirds. So rejoice when you have mistletoe in your peeps. Don't worry about it. You know, you're feeding bluebirds. So we have a lot of bluebirds at our house. Now, I did bait that one in. That's a, a rail with seeds on it. Oh, not seeds, they don't eat seeds, mealworms. And then woodpeckers. Woodpeckers have uh, provide food for hummingbirds in the winter. So the hummingbirds are going to sip that sap. So you'll find the woodpeckers have their own little um, contingent of hummingbirds. So this is also a, I hope there's a video coming up. This um, tells you about bush tits. This bush tit nest is right on the boardwalk along the rail trail. Is that right, Rick? Am I saying that right? On the other, the boardwalk trail at Ankeny. I don't know if you, if they're, yeah. And so you can tell male bush tits from females because the males have a dark eye and the females have a white eye. Um, I make my own suet out of morel lard. Special ground peanut butter from Inco, and various things I find at the bulk food stores at Inco. What sticks it all together is polenta or corn meal, but you can put 
Dale one of the videos that I order online from exotic nutrition very cheaply here to Max. You can put millet in it. Um, but at any rate, you can just line a um, pie pan with baking paper and then put a half a pound of lard and a half a pound of peanut butter, melt it in the microwave, and just starting adding this stuff. And so we go through two a day. So we put it out and we don't let it sit. It doesn't get hot and rot. And in the summer, we don't put it out at all. So you can see what we get in a meeting like that. And that's, that was the recipe. Of course, you're going to get pots if you've got birds. So every once in a while, we're going to put your pot. And so we went to the coast and got big primrose seeds and planted them. And in the summertime, they bring in pollinators. In the winter, they feed the all kinds of seeds and birds. And so you have your own packet of seeds to take home and grow and rear them. So that's um, various seed eaters, gold finches, et cetera. And I didn't know until we moved out there that the uh, woodpeckers ate the seeds. I, that was new to me. This is Laethia. Um, if you come to the Marion Master Gardener's plant sale at the fairgrounds the first weekend of May, I will give you Laethia seeds. Started receiving uh, Lynn Boyer and Mark Kraupman have given me many, many seeds that I, uh, volunteers repackage them. And we give away native seeds so you can have your own native garden. And Laethia is one of them. This is uh, goldenrod and heritage seedlings. We live across, across where the trees are. And so Ray has a wood shop in the backyard or in his garage, and he makes lots and lots of uh, nest boxes. We don't put nest boxes out in the open like this because it's too hot. Ray's done his own uh, temperature studies and found out that the temperatures inside the box can raise to temperatures that will kill the, the eggs and the nestlings. So we always have them in the shade. The bird seeds that fly in like a field bird, well, we won't put it in the forest. We'll put it in a shady area on the house or the branch, oh, to an open area, and then you don't have to worry so much. Otherwise, you need to be nailing aluminum foil to it in hot days to um, reflect the heat. We don't put the aluminum foil on the trunk anymore. We found that some of the birds were too nervous to go in, so we just put the aluminum foil on the sides of the top. We do a bluebird trail at the core of Heritage Seedlings Farms, and this is around one of their lakes. And the swallows have been used to that for 20 years, and so we don't really move those, so we foil them. You can keep cats in or out by having cat food fencing, which helps at the top. And uh, the cats are a major predator. Um, Portland Audubon and Feral Cat Coalition has a wonderful website about patios, cat patios. And you can go on a patio tour in September and for a small donation if you get one time. They've got these pictures. Um, I'm sure they have brochures and things that they'll send you or you can see online. But um, it's kind of fun to go on the So at our house, Ray put up a box thinking we might get wood ducks because we live by their um, putting creek comes out of the ground. But we got a uh, creek owl. And it come about half the years that we've lived here. But he's given boxes to neighbors. So it goes there and it goes to a natural cavity. And so so we can usually see his creek owl every year. Um, what these birds have in common is they are cavities. So without cavities, we don't have certain types of birds. So, um, these are the bluebird. This is some of Ray's bluebird boxes. You have to be very careful about the hole size. If you start getting house sparrows, they will kill the mother bird on the nest, and they will kill all the babies, and they will peck holes in the nest. And because we do uh, bird nest boxing, nest box monitoring on heritage seedlings for farms. This year we've had many, many 
incidences of these birds dying and never completing their life cycle because they were killed by house plants. So the hole sizes, um, one thing you can do, some kind of slit holes are better, some kind of diamond holes, but if you have house sparrows, you need to be prepared to capture them. So we buy um, mealworms, and if they're feeding babies, I put the water in that dish because I think if they're going back to the nest cavity, the babies will get dehydrated. They're getting their, they took all their water from the feed. So I don't feed wild mealworms if they're feeding the babies. And then we discovered all kinds of things. Um, the female will go on to nest again, and so the male is left to raise the babies. They never knew that. So um, this is the free tail that comes to live with us. And this year, or that year, he lived down the street in a snag at somebody else's house. This is our house, and we created several snags. This tree was too close to the house, and I think it was a non-native species. Am I telling the truth? It was a diseased red cedar. So we had it snagged, and it's now you know, a bird habitat tree. It, they need to rot in place five years before they're soft enough, so we had to make a hole in them. Um, we got really good at telling whose nest it is when we were opening boxes when we were doing our monitoring. Stick nests are always wren nests, and they always have brown eggs. Uh, so these are the opening sizes that Ray recommends for different kinds of birds. And that's Ray putting up an owl box. And you should leave your leaves in place. And if you, you want to mow over them, you can. But unless Ray's putting leaves on a garden plot, you can leave them in trees. It doesn't rot on the lawn. You have all the bugs living on the So, um, and then this is a junco nest at Elohim Golf Course. It's on the ground. So if you have a perfect lawn, you're not going to have this. They have some wild areas at Elohim that. Um, the Junkos brown nest birds. We just, I was, Cassie and I were out there exploring one day and uh, we saw the birds going back to the same places. So we went and looked and found it was a Junko nest. Killdeers um, nest right in the road. So if you've got a road, watch yourself. This is a platform in our garage. So robins are going to, you just put a platform under a shady area. You might get to be lucky and get robins to come over. All right, and then this comes from Claire Kirchie wrote a book for um, Portland Bureau of Environmental Services, and this tells people when to mow and when to trim so you're not killing birds. Because you've got to remember that hummingbirds can even start nesting in January and February, so you've got to be careful if you're going to be trimming branches. You've got to be aware of that. Okay, we bought this um, branch Jim Leonard gave me, and I put peanut butter in the hole, and I got my picture that way. So I'm not above hating the thing. So this is the creek that runs by our house in the summer, and this is a um, building in Portland, or in Salem somewhere. So which do you think is a habitat for birds? Which do you think they would rather live in? If your place is all trimmed and mowed like that, there's no habitat. There's nothing to eat. There's no place to hide. The lawn's being mowed. Uh, you know, there's no reeds in the pond. So it's better to let things go wild, in my opinion. So these are the house sparrows that you will kill. And, um, and we, and you can read this as well as I can. We have witnessed the killing. Um, you can show you, if you have a problem, you can show you how to build a chat box and what to do with them. And starlings, 
would get in and start selling because the buyer could take over our all of those spots. So um, you have to be aware of that. This is how we keep birds from flying into our windows. Uh, Ray got the idea from his helping bird savers, but he actually made this himself. At first, we just hung strings loose. So these strings are hung loose. And then we found out about his helping bird savers, and Ray made these strings. They need to be close enough together so that the bird doesn't think it can fit through. So not that far apart. We also have doors that we can't string, so we uh, move uh, lines. You can go down to the art department and get a pen right by glass. A sticker here and there it doesn't work. That bird sees that reflection and thinks it's a place to go. So certain times of day, your windows will have reflections that actually invite them. And we even have strings on our back slider door because we've had a woodpecker fly in our kitchen, go into the living room, and smash into that window inside and fall into my lap when I was in the rocker. So you've got to uh, think about all these things. Um, brush piles are good. When we moved out there and took away all those blackberry bushes, Ray had the foresight to create brush piles. And where do you get brush piles in the middle of the winter? They went down to where the Boy Scouts were getting for recycling back Christmas trees. And so we had these piles and piles of Christmas trees all over. And they rotted in just a few years. They were, they're not there. There's no trace of them. So you need to keep your brush piles going. So I like snakes. And so we uh, photograph these snakes on our property. Snakes are pretty cool if you just sit there, you know, and don't do that, you can just get down on the ground and get your snake side level picture. And there was a gopher snake in Melbourne. And I said, Ray, I want to get a picture of this pond, but he's just looking at me. I suppose it's me to you. So Ray came behind me and went like this, and he got stung out. Got my picture. Um, I don't know why I took this picture. Anyway, snakes do trade with us. That's probably why I took the picture. And they, that's probably what I saw that possum. If you're, you should do water, you should have water that's shallow. Ponds don't really help. Um, they'll, if you had some quail drown or something, then it's just a little bit too deep. So we got rid of it because I felt so bad. And so we just put some shallow. We got this at Wild Birds Unlimited, and it's very shallow, and they keep a brush by it. Ray came up with the bright idea of having these graduated heat trays because a bird could walk out of it. And then the automatic drip is on a timer. And so you don't have to think about filling it with water. You just have to think about keeping it clean. And then this is for keeping bees from drowning. So if you have a regular pond, you're going to have invasive species like bullfrogs, which you can't mosquitoes, and my favorite. Um, this is the screech owl that lived at our neighbors one year because Ray gave us my spot. He had got caught in the netting around their tomatoes. And so they found it in the middle of the night, and the two babies were on the fence calling to the mother. The mother was totally trapped in the netting. So if you're going to net things, you don't want netting the size of birds that get trapped in. So they released her, and she came and drank and drank and drank and drank to feed her. She drank so long that it was to the very end of her life. So this is how you can find out about um, cats, patios. This is how you can find out about native plants um, for the Willamette Valley. You can download this road with the tree from Portland Metro. And these are various things that you can learn from. And Eileen Stark has a great public book publishes from Portland. Ray, she's helped Ray with um, landscaping his whole house in Portland. Her website is Real Gardens Real Native. There's a great book, Landscaping for Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest, and then Ray uses woodworking for wildlife to have plants to put nest back in. Um, this was taken from our kitchen 
I will open the sliding doors to dogs and mealworms. And little birds actually become tame. You know, they see you drive up and they come to you. They don't go away from you so that you put out the mailbox. And uh, the end, there you go. Thank you for your patience on our technical glitches on this yes, we can do. I can bring out another sign that he is and uh down there to try to help us with that. He used to print out the paper from a while ago from that book. Thank you for coming.